I'm just not having a good time with score predictions, aren't I? Let's go on to the positives and talk about some amazing football. What's up everyone? Welcome back to a brand new video on the channel. Today, I don't really like go through this video every Monday, especially when I get zero correct scores, but we have to go through what we learned in the championship and a lot unraveled. We saw Wayne Rooney take part of his first game as Derby manager. We saw some very interesting results take place as well. We saw the top three struggling to get all three points as well. We've got a lot to discuss. If you did get a correct score, your comment will be on the screen. Right now, a couple of you did well done. All of you I managed to get a correct score. This is what the Lexus Hall of Fame now looks like going into the match day 15. I'm just stalling here. I'm proving to be very inconsistent this season. Very frustrating. I've got zero correct scores. But I couldn't even tell you the amount of games I was only one goal off. So frustrating to say the least. But I'll hide my frustration in this video. But as of now, I've got zero correct. So if you guys like to see, want to see more championship content from me, please make sure you do give this video a like. It's tremendously appreciated. If you haven't done, please subscribe to the channel. It would really, really make my day. And if you haven't done, please share my video to as many people as you can. YouTubers, friends, and to your social media. All about it would really make my day. With any further ado... Let's go through what we learned in the Championship this weekend. So start off with Friday's game, Brentford and Chris Rangers, the West London derby. It ended as Brentford being victorious 2-1. And I think it's been over a year now since Queen's Park Rangers have won a game played on Friday and a game live on Sky Sports. I mean, if Queen's Park Rangers are broadcasted live on Sky Sports, you wouldn't be betting money if that Queen's Park Rangers would win. But going into this game, I actually think it was quite an even contest. Brentford did take the lead. It was a nicely worked goal, actually. Ivan Tony managed to head a long ball. Rico Henry picking now Vitali Janel just outside the box, striking a very clean shot past the reach of Dieng. That made it 1-0 to Brentford. But Queensborough Rangers had a pretty good response, and I dare say they were looking very, very dangerous. Brian Sai Samuel will do tremendously well in the right-hand side. You'll be very disappointed on the Sorensen's part, but he didn't manage to deal with him. But he just about managed to get enough of a touch to get across to Lyndon Dykes to smash the ball in the roof of the net. And that made it 1-1. And Queensborough Rangers were slowly but surely starting to grow into the game. But unfortunately, they just couldn't find the right penetration and the right formula to get through that defence. They were just really, really wasteful with their opportunities. And in the second half, Brentford managed to show why they are up there in the table. Even if they're not playing at their best, they still find a way to score a goal. You know, the contrast between the two goals was insane. You got to score a goal from open play, which was quite well worked. And their second goal was from a free kick and a set piece. It was wonderfully lifted by Marcondes. And then enough of a header by Eve Antoni to make it 2-1, who's deputised Ollie Watkins very, very well. Chris Bar Rangers did have a couple of opportunities, but unfortunately, they just weren't clinical enough. And Tom Carroll did get sent off from two yellow cards. One of them was from bringing one of the players down in the box, which was, I think, was a bit of a silly booking, especially with a silly position for the free kick. And the second one was just a really late challenge. It was a very poor decision on his part. Both sides, of course, have really key games coming up in midweek. Both will be wanting to win. Brentford, they're just outside of the top six right now. If they continue this form, then maybe Raven can have a really good season. And then we saw Reading go back to winning ways, beating Bristol City by three goals to one. I think a lot of people will look at this game differently. Some people will say that Bristol City were really bad, which is why Reading managed to blow them away. But to be honest, I felt Reading, just from minute one, looked like the Reading of old. They actually had chances. They didn't take all of them because Daniel Brentley was actually really good in goal. But Reading were just absolutely ruthless in that midfield. It showed glimpses of what they were like against Bournemouth. But except they actually took their chances. And defensively, they were really, really good. They were unlucky to concede anyway. Ejaro scored the first goal from the second half. It was from a shot from just outside the box. And it came in from a really bad deflection into the net. That made it 1-0. A bit unfortunate for Bristol City's part. But they had a good response. A bit of a lifeline. Naki Wells getting an equaliser. Quite controversial because it was clear that Naki Wells was offside with that goal. Goal. So we shouldn't have been talked in a VAR was in the championship. They would have ruled that goal out. So a bit of a lifeline. Bristol City got back into the game. But you've got to admire Reading's mentality. They did not feel sorry for themselves. And they went forward. Elise's pass to find Yaku Mate one on one. I mean, well done on him. It was an unbelievable pass. Mate did all the talk and finished it off to make it 2-1 to Reading. 
and Lucas Jam managed to finish off the scoring in stoppage time. Brilliant composure and skill on his part and control to make it 3-1 to Reading. It's a poor defeat on Bristol City's part. They're now sixth place in the table if they're not careful and if they're not consistent enough they're going to start dropping out of it. Reading right now is going to be interesting. If they can respond with another win in midweek, then I say Reading could be a reasonable force, but they need to make sure that they do not go on a dry spell with five games without a win again, because they cannot afford that, especially if they want to be a top seven championship. But with their performances, I am deeply encouraged by Reading. Then we start with the three o'clock. The first one being a bit of a stinker. Birmingham and Mirwall, nil-nil. I even remember my score predictions thinking it was either 1-1, nil-nil. I backed this game to be decent 1-1. Should have been nil-nil right from the start. Literally two very low scoring sides. Why did I not bloody say nil-nil? I'm so bad at predicting sometimes or going against my instincts. I think both goalkeepers only had one notable save to make. The best opportunity in the game I actually think came to Millwall where I think it was Jake Cooper who did an acrobatic shot and Neil Everest did a really, really good save actually in the final few minutes of the game. But apart from that, very, very poor. Both sides deserve to draw in that game. Both sides will be definitely wanting a response in midweek. They both definitely had the intention of not getting beat. They've got a draw. They'll have to take that draw going forward. I think Mill will overall be the most disappointed in terms of the chances they had. Birmingham, they know deep down they need to improve. But the lack of goals and especially the teams below them are starting to claw into them. So Birmingham definitely need to be a bit wary of their goal scoring. And then to a game where I thought it was going to be nil-nil, it wasn't nil-nil. It was a Blackburn win, 2-1. I have to say, a pretty entertaining game from both sides, actually. If anything, I think a draw would have actually been the most realistic result. Barnsley had 23 shots, 23, which is amazing, really. But unfortunately, they just weren't clinical enough. And Blackburn just opened up Barnsley way too many opportunities that they probably needed to. But having said that, I actually would dare say both sides did look quite good. Adam Armstrong got the first goal, nicely worked down on his part. Sam Gallagher's goal was pretty nice as well. At first thought, I thought it was a bit of a deflection, but actually it was a really well struck shot on his part. That made it 2-0. And then Ronald Palmer managed to get one back, well deserved as well, because Barnsley, especially down their channels, looked really, really good. And Kaminsky made a couple of fantastic saves. Although Walton did the same as well. Walton made some great saves. Overall, it's two great performances between two sides. I do have to say, I think both sides will feel really proud of their performances either way. And then to a result I did not see coming at all. Cardiff City 4. Four goals from Cardiff City. Luton nil. I mean, I'll tell you what, all the problems that Luton had last year had almost come to bite them in this game. Problems that Luton didn't have at all have now just started to form in this game. I mean, Cardiff, they were going to win this game. They scored two goals in the first nine minutes of this game. And we were talking about Neil Harris being under pressure in this game. He completely defied critics on Saturday and he managed to get a clean sheet and a 4-0 win. A very convincing win as well. Luton really did not look threatening at all. And it was more or less so due to their set piece defending, which was really dreadful, if I'm going to be honest, with Luton Town's perspective. They were really, really bad at the back. Sean Morrison was completely unmarked when he scored his goal. And then Harris scored his second one. Once again, lack of closing people down. It was summed up by Sluger's mistake. And he was lucky that Cardiff didn't score a third from that. But Cardiff did score a third for Kiefer Moore in the second half. Once again, it was a set piece, a corner. No lack of defending there. And then Shea Ojo managed to get the final goal. Really well struck goal on his part. Definitely the best goal in that game. Luton will be very, very disappointed. They'll be hoping for a good response in midweek. Cardiff, a great win, but they need to keep up this form if they want to have a really, really good season. Neil House cannot afford Cardiff to start being a bit inconsistent. And then with our bottom of the table clash, we see Derby and Wickham drawing one. 1-1 and I think Derby did deserve to get a win in this game but unfortunately for them they just couldn't kill the game. Dwayne Holmes scored a fantastic goal for Derby. It was actually a really nicely worded goal. It was just some of the things that were missing from Derby and unfortunately they had Ryan Allsop which was really really good in goal. He kept everything out that Derby had at them and Rooney would be so disappointed for the fact they did concede in the 81st minute to Matt Bloomfield. Once again, it was poorly cleared by Derby's part. Maybe Marshall could have done better with the ball. Bloomfield slid in, tapping the ball past the line that made it 1-1. And Wickham came the closest to winning in the end when they managed to hit the crossbar. So either way, Derby actually nearly lost that game, which they couldn't afford it. It's a valuable point, I say, for both of these sides, but... 
with their next coming games, I think Derby have definitely got a really good amount of games coming up. Definitely some winnable games. If they can take those and get three points and start climbing up the table, then maybe Derby can scurry and save themselves a bit. As we can right now, it's another away point, which I'll be happy with. But their lack of goals is ultimately going to cost them. They've only scored seven goals so far in 14 games. 0.5 goals scored a game. They definitely need to prove their goal scoring. And then to a mad game in the John Smith Stadium. Huddersfield 3, Middlesbrough 2. <sighs> I did not expect this result to be out of the blue, really. For the fact that Middlesbrough conceded three goals. But also for the fact that Middlesbrough scored two goals. Completely out of the ordinary game, which is typically what you see in the championship. Carol Iting is just in such an incredible run of form. I believe it's four goals in three games or something for him now. He's been an absolute revelation for Huddersfield. Getting him on loan from Ajax, he's really, really improved that side. He's got a terrific goal to make it 1-1. Although Middlesbrough did take the lead, I almost forgot about Middlesbrough's lead from Marvin Johnson. A nicely worked goal actually, which did put Middlesbrough in front. But as I said, Iting was really, really good equalizing. And then Huddersfield took the lead. Lewis O'Brien completely robbing the ball, charging forward. And it was Fraser Campbell who managed to score Huddersfield's second goal that made it 2-1 to Huddersfield. Although Middlesbrough were given a bit of a lifeline in the second half where Naby Saar carelessly fouled a somber long in the box, which caused them to have a penalty. The summer longer scored a penalty that made it 2-2 but Josh Karoma scoring an absolute cracker in the final few minutes of the game made it 3-2 to Huddersfield and I dare say with performance wise it was really really well deserved. I was a bit disappointed with Middlesbrough. What was really disappointing me with Middlesbrough in this game was the lack of closing players down. The fact they didn't close the players down Huddersfield had way too much space and opportunity to take, to take shots and because they had that space they really punished Middlesbrough for it. And better than any, I think, could have done better with one of the shots. Maybe Iting's goal he probably could have done better with. But either way, it's not a good game for Middlesbrough. As with Huddersfield right now, they're occasionally getting good results here and there. But they need to string a good amount of results together if they want to have a really, really good season. But performance-wise, with the tools that Corbran has got, he's doing an incredible job. And then we saw maybe an unexpected result. Norwich and Coventry drawing a 1-1 draw. And I do dare say it was a little bit deserved. It was a tale of two halves. I thought Norwich were pretty good in the first half. Pachetta won a penalty. And for me, it definitely was a penalty. Vrancic managed to score the penalty. That made it 1-0 to Norwich. And he did continuously look dangerous going forward. But I didn't know about the injury of Tim Krull. If I knew it, then maybe I might have given Coventry a bit of a chance. And in the second half, Coventry were relentless. They were really hitting Norwich under a load of pressure, they hit the bar, they had so many guilt edge chances to eventually get their equaliser and they eventually got it in the 89th minute for Maxime Biamu, just simply tapping it into net that made it 1-1. Coventry would be proud for that away point, I think it's their second away point so far this season. They definitely need to start winning away from home to get some more points on the board but I think it's a valuable point following that Nautica Forest did manage to win this weekend, gaining a little bit of breathing space in terms of the relegation pack as well. In terms of Norwich, it's a little bit of a poor defeat, they're still first place in the table but they could have increased their lead a little bit from the chasing pack below them if I had a win there could it be valuable points drop maybe for Norwich but they need to cope with their injuries if they can cope with their injuries Norwich can definitely be a really good side this season and then to another side of the top dropping needless points was Bournemouth when they drew 2-2 with Bournemouth now Bournemouth did take a lead albeit a very controversial penalty I thought it was really harsh to give a penalty for that I mean Tom Daly was playing well for Bournemouth there in that first penalty but Stanislas stepped up he scored it that made it 1-0 to Bournemouth and I think almost richly deserved or justice wise Rotherham went ahead to Freddie Ledapa goes the former Chelmsford City player on loan scoring two goals you love to see it and both of his goals were really nicely worked as well Begovic actually kept a couple of his shots out as well if he hadn't had actually kept it out Ledapa could have had a hat-trick in this game but overall when Rotherham did go 2-1 up they were guilty of allowing Bournemouth to get back into this and eventually Dominic Solanke when he came on he managed to score that made it 2-2 and following Bournemouth's equaliser they peppered Rotherham with so many chances and Rotherham did well to hold out but it's a bit disappointing in my part for the fact that they had those two great goals from Ladapo but they didn't build from it they didn't build defensively they didn't control or dictate play if they did then I actually would have seen Rotherham winning this game I was surprised Bournemouth got back into it and the fact that Bournemouth got back into it and all of a sudden they were now in control again I was like what happened to Rotherham and it's clear to see that Bournemouth are not going to be 10 out of 10 performances every single week but the fact they're still getting points when they're not playing well it's key and I think that's definitely going to help Bournemouth in the long run. Both sides have got an important game in midweek. It's going to be interesting to see the outcome in both of them. And then to another boring game, a 0-0 draw, which was Sheffield Wednesday and Stoke. Tony Pulis playing against his former club. 
really, really bad game overall. In terms of the sides who I think had the better opportunities, I think it was Stoke. I think they did dictate play a little bit more. Sam Vokes had a couple of good chances in this game. Sheffield Wednesday barely threatened, unfortunately. They didn't have a shot on target. Literally even more boring than the Birmingham and Millwall game, which I'm a little bit surprised that I can actually say that. But we'll move on from that one quickly. I was going to predict what 0-0 as well, and I also went for 1-1 in this game. So I'm so gutted that I didn't stick with my instincts. So we move on. We'll hopefully both of these sides can have a more entertaining game in midweek. Sheffield Wednesday definitely need the points more urgently for the fact they're 23rd. They need to start winning more consistently. Defensively, they look okay now, but they need points, Sheffield Wednesday. And hopefully for them, they can get a couple in midweek. And Preston's away record is now dwindling, which is two away defeats in a row now, both in an aggregate score of 6-2. Watford beating Preston by four goals to one. I mean, Preston, you're not the only side to lose 4-1 against Watford at Vicarage Road, so don't you worry. But Watford did take the lead after Preston had a pretty good spell in the opening 10 minutes of the game, but Domingo Kina managed to score. Pretty scrappy goal, poor defence from Preston's part to make it 1-0 to Watford. Troy Deeney made a huge difference and Watford did have the chance to get a two-goal lead when they won a penalty. It was a penalty in my opinion. Deeney saw the chest of it and Sark got the ball but he got fouled in the box, it was a penalty. Deeney stepped up scoring his first goal in the Championship this season to make it 2-0. But Tom Barkusen made things interesting when he got back for Preston for 2-1. Nutmeg Sark drove forward, took a shot, deflected off Joe Garner to run for Ben Foster. That made it 2-1. And I thought Preston could maybe grow into this game following the pressure they had. But then literally a couple of minutes later, they scored a two-goal lead Watford from a fantastic team goal. Did you see the assist from Troy Deeney when he just dinked the ball over the back line? to find Nathaniel Chalaba with a lot of space, shooting it past Declan Rudd to make it 3-1. Probably my goal of the weekend, actually. It was a great teamwork goal. And then Jao Pedro managed to finish things off. And unfortunately, when it was a two-goal advantage, Preston were completely peppered. And that's what I was really worried about Preston at the moment. And the thing is, I didn't even half expect it because Preston have not spent any money in this whole transfer window. If they don't spend to improve players, that's what's going to happen to this club, unfortunately. So... Preston, of course, doing quite well last year, but they did clearly find this year a little bit more tougher. Maybe for the fact they don't have fans is probably affecting them as well, but they definitely needed to do a lot more in that transfer window if they wanted to compete in the championship, and they definitely paying the price for it. As for Watford, it's a great win for them, great response for them for following two games without a win. They've now got a very convincing win. If they can win in midweek, they could be in a fantastic position. I have to say, Watford, on their day, very dangerous. And then to our final game we had yesterday, Nottingham Forest nil, Swansea won. And I dare say, how have Nottingham Forest not scored as many goals as I had with the attacking players I had? They got Knockart in the team, Lyle Taylor, Graben. They've got so many good players, Harry Arter. How are they not winning these games constantly? It's just the biggest question about for why Derby are down there. The East Midlands club are so underperforming this season. And it showed in this game. Knockart has some brilliant opportunities in this game, but he just didn't test Woodman at all. And it's a real shame, really. Really. But Swansea took the lead in the 43rd minute for Connor Roberts, who's been absolutely brilliant. If I'm rising, I think he's the highest scoring defender so far this season. He's definitely the most expensive player in terms of the Championship Fantasy League. He's definitely one player you'd ought to get if you want to get goals and clean sheets as well. And Swansea have actually conceded the less goals in the league, which is absolutely unbelievable for the fact they lost such a good player for Joe Rodon, who was good for Spurs, by the way, against Chelsea. I'm so annoyed, but I'm glad for him as a player that he did well. Ultimately, I thought Swansea were going to struggle with his absence, but they've got a real good back line. And they showed it in this game and they could have scored even more. Andre Ayew had an acrobatic effort that went a little bit wide of the post. And Nottingham Forest were ultimately a bit lucky that Swansea didn't win by more. It's really bad defeat for Nottingham Forest. They're 21st place in the table right now. Chris Hewton trying to work something, but it's clearly not clicking with these players. He needs time, basically. But how much time do you want to give Chris Hewton? Because Chris Hewton's really good at what he does. But unfortunately, he's, he seems to be struggling with his slot a little bit. In terms of Swansea, their third place following this win. Fantastic result for them. I can see them going places. So that wraps up the Championship Match Day 14. Here is the table. Norwich first, Bournemouth second, Watford third, Swansea, Reading and Bristol City make the rest of the top six. They go to the rest of the top half with Brentford and Stoke just outside with Blackburn, Middlesbrough, Millwall and Luton making up the top half of the table. Then you've got Huddersfield, Cardiff, Queen's Park Rangers, Barnsley pushing up there. And then you go to the lower part of the table with Birmingham, Preston, Rotherham, and then with the teams a bit in danger, Coventry, Nottingham Forest, Wickham, Sheffield Wednesday, and of course, Derby Rock Bottom. So there we go. Before we move on to my midweek predictions, I'm going to say my goal for weekend, player for weekend, and the result for weekend. 
Player of the Weekend's really, really tough for me to put my finger on because there are so many good performances this weekend. But I'm going to give it to Freddy Ladapo for the two goals he managed to get for Rotherham. He carried this side across to play against the Bournemouth side very, very well as well. I'm going to give my Player of the Weekend to Freddy Ladapo. Goal of the Weekend's really tough. I was thinking Shea Ojo's goal. I was also thinking of Lucas Giles' individual brilliance against Bristol City. But I'm going to give it for the teamwork purposes to Nathaniel Chalaber's goal. The build-up to that goal was just sublime. So I'm giving my goal of the weekend to Nathaniel Chalaber. And then a result of the weekend. There's so many results to pick from. I'm going to say Reading's response against Bristol City for the fact they were in a poor run of form to beat Bristol City. Their promotion rivals by three goals to one. Absolutely brilliant. My resolve weekend goes to Reading. So obviously the last part of this video is my midweek predictions. Now I've actually not written down my predictions, which is a new tactic I'm going to make. Literally, I'm just going to make the decisions on the spot. So we'll start off with, why don't we start with Cardiff and Huddersfield? Um, I'm going to say 1-1. One, one. Um, Birmingham, Barnsley, 1-0 Barnsley. Bournemouth and Preston, oh dear. 2-0 um, Bournemouth. Derby and Coventry. Um, you know what? I think Derby will win this one. 1-0. One Queen's Park Rangers and Bristol City. 2-1 Bristol City. Rotherham and Brentford. 0-0 um, actually. Now we go to Wednesday's games. Middlesbrough and Swansea. Um, I'm going to say 1-1. One, one. Blackburn and Millwall. 2-1 Blackburn. Luton and Norwich. 1-1. One, one. Nottingham Forest and Watford. No thoughts. I'm going to say 1-0 Watford. Sheffield Wednesday and Reading. 2-1 Reading. Wickham and Stoke. 0-0 nil, nil, in my opinion. So that wraps it up. This is my final championship predictions for midweek. So we'll see if this approach manages to get me more correct predictions this week. If you guys like and you want to see more content, please make sure to give this video a like. tremendously appreciate it. If you haven't done, please subscribe to the channel. We did very well subscribers last video. 337 now. Let's push for 350 to maybe even 400 before Christmas. All of that would really make my day. And to do that, please share my channel to YouTubers, your friends, your social media. All of that would really make my day. But thank you guys so much for watching. You guys are legendary. If you're sending this video and as always take care